On the 8th of May, 1945, the surviving soldiers of the Kurland army marched into captivity. Thus began the final phase of the war, a struggle that proved to be vastly different from the battles we had previously experienced. A bitter fight for survival began, a battle for which there exists little defence. Herded together like cattle, we were first confined in open fields and forests clearings. As our hunger increased, we desperately attempted to draw nourishment from grass in the fields, and we chewed bark from trees in attempts to stave off the gnawing pains of starvation that overwhelmed and weakened us. We were eventually marched to a large camp situated in a former paper factory near the town of Slocker, on the Bay of Riga. Here we received our first sparse rations, which were accompanied by an issue of a dozen papyrossi cigarettes and ten grams of sugar. It was explained to us that the cigarette and sugar rations were the same afforded the junior officers in the Soviet army, and we were surprised that this distinction existed within the workers' and farmers' army. In the German Wehrmacht, all ranks had always received identical rations. At length we were addressed by a flak officer who had been taken prisoner at Stalingrad in January 1st, 943, a member of the National Committee of German Officers which was led by another better-known Stalingrad survivor, General von Sedelitz. The lieutenant had received training as a polytruck in a Moscow prison camp. He implored us to embrace the communist-Leninist ideology, speaking tirelessly of the new world in which we must live, a world that could be made better only through the communist system. His remarks were met mostly by indifference from the Kurland soldiers. However, the political rhetoric was greeted with enthusiasm by a few individuals, some of whom perhaps perceived a better chance of surviving the ordeal by cooperating fully with the authorities in whose hands our destiny lay. Over the next several days, propaganda documents were distributed. To relieve boredom, some soldiers began to study Russian. Others attempted to mend threadbare clothing, while some fashioned crude curland armbands from bits of uniform material. At last we were permitted to write letters. Due to a lack of writing material and envelopes, we wrote on whatever scraps and bits of paper we could find within our sparse belongings. Written with stubs of previously concealed pencils, the letters were folded into compact triangles and carefully addressed to family members. More than 1,000 letters were painstakingly written to inform family members that the writers had survived the last months of the war. However, none reached the homeland. The letters did provide information to the NKVD officers who, unbeknownst to the prisoners, confiscated them and combed through the contents, gleaning information for the exhaustive files that would remain to haunt us throughout our captivity. On one occasion we stood shirtless in ranks with an uplifted left arm as Soviet intelligence officers searched for the blood group tattoos that were characteristic only of members of the Waffen-SS. Those prisoners found to have the identifying mark below their left armpit were quickly separated from the ranks, and they simply disappeared into the void of the Soviet Union. One morning in mid-July we were ordered to prepare to march. Formed into long grey ranks, six abreast, we were flanked by Soviet soldiers wearing sweeping overcoats despite the heat of summer. Across the breasts of many guards were slung submachine guns with the round, drum-shaped magazines that had become so familiar to us during the war. Other guards carried infantry rifles at the ready, with mounted bayonets gleaming menacingly in the sunlight. We marched in a long column toward the Sloka railway station. A rumour circulated through the ranks that a large number of enlisted prisoners from a nearby camp had been engaged in preparing cattle cars to transport us toward the east. On our arrival at the marshalling yard, roll call was taken again, and we were assigned into groups to board the train. Uneasiness swept through the ranks as we realised that a new, more ominous phase was beginning. Glancing desperately about, I realised that it was impossible to avoid climbing into the dark opening in the side of the car, and I reluctantly boarded the cattle car as a pair of armed guards, accompanied by an officer, methodically checked each name against a roster. After the car filled with an allotted number of prisoners, the large door was slid shut, leaving us in semi-darkness. A dim light was provided by a narrow opening in the wall of the car near the door, where a provisional toilet, made of two rough-cut boards hammered together at a right angle, emptied alongside the rails. We stood packed within the rail cars until after nightfall, 
Slowly the cars began to move, the inhabitants swaying silently with the movement of the train, packed closely together, each member of the group lost again in private thoughts of home and survival. We travelled throughout the night, and as the train slowed to a crawl, I was able to discern the horizon growing light with dawn through the crack near the door. In the early morning hours, I could vaguely identify the city of Riga silhouetted against the sky. We passed slowly over the Duna, creaking over the hastily repaired railway bridge where, during the night of 13, the 14th of October, 1944, I had briefly stood with my commander before the bridge was demolished behind us during our retreat to Kurland. We continued toward the east. The train rolled toward the area east of Vitebsk, and our sojourn was interrupted by numerous inexplicable stops of varied duration. During the journey we were provided with a ration of one salt herring and one slice of bread per man. A small container of water was occasionally passed through the door of the car at some stops. As the suffering from thirst grew in intensity, attempts to bribe guards during the stops became commonplace. Gold wedding rings, carefully hidden from the enemy soldiers during the initial phases of surrender, were offered in exchange for a small canteen cup of water. This misery became especially acute in the rear sections of the train, where the sparse rations of water often failed to reach the inmates before the container was emptied. During this phase of the journey, my soldier's luck remained with me, as I was situated only a short distance from the car reserved for the guards. Thus, I was able to trade some carefully hoarded papyrossi cigarettes for cups of water during the occasions when we were commanded to Naborni. Get out. We eventually reached a bivouac area far to the east of the Volkov, where we had fought the vicious winter battles in the previous years south of Lake Ladoga. Here we were provided large, American-made tents for quarters. Rations were delivered large wooden casks of salted fish and crates of cabbage. I was assigned by the senior German officer to establish a field kitchen for rationing and preparing the fish and cabbage. A number of enlisted prisoners from a nearby camp were detailed to us as cooks and kitchen workers. The distinctive Nazi emblem of the German Wehrmacht, an eagle clutching a wreathed swastika, was soon ordered removed from the breast of our tunics and from our caps. The routine plundering by the guards and Soviet intelligence personnel continued. Anything of monetary value or any object that could be regarded as a souvenir was taken. I had hidden a small wristwatch behind the cockade insignia on my officer's visored cap, which escaped seizure. Our paper money was confiscated whenever found by the authorities. Due to lack of toilet paper, a number of prisoners had resorted to using our now worthless military payscript at the latrines, and this currency was plentiful among the prisoners, as there had been nothing available for purchase on the battlefront. One morning, several of us were astonished to observe a Soviet lieutenant and sergeant slink into the slit trench that served as a latrine and fish out a number of these bills, which they washed clean in a nearby stream. We later heard that there existed a lucrative trade in exchanging this German currency for rubles, which accounted for their enthusiasm in collecting the bills. I quickly became obsessed with the idea of escape. Despite the sparse rations of fish soup and bits of bread, I managed to hoard enough dried crumbs to collect a small emergency ration, which remained concealed at the bottom of my Wehrmacht-issue bread bag. I was certain that the Bay of Finland lay between 100 and 200 kilometres distance, and I began to formulate an escape plan to the north. These hopes were soon dashed after consulting with my friend Volrath, who had served as a geologist with the Kurland Army Staff. He advised me that our location lay at least 800 kilometres from the sea, and reminded me that winter would soon be upon us. Despite my enthusiasm to escape, I was soberly aware that an attempt to traverse that distance in winter, without proper food or clothing, would ultimately end only in death through recapture or starvation. The camp of tents was broken in late summer, and the imprisoned officers were separated into groups for the transfer to various penal camps. The majority were sent to Borovici, including my longtime friend and prison companion Dr. Leopold Schilp, the cheerful staff doctor from Mainz, who would later, while serving as camp physician, keep me alive during periods of grave illness due to malnourishment. The method of determining how the prisoners were segregated into groups remained a mystery to us,
and I was assigned to a small body of 40 officers ranging in rank from Leutnant to Hauptmann, including a Luftwaffe medical doctor. Many prisoners were already compelled to wear crude wooden clogs as replacements for their officers' boots, which were eagerly sought by the Russian Soldateska and were often surrendered to the guards at gunpoint or traded for food. The loose clogs were worn on the long march through swampy terrain to the railhead for the transport to new camps. I had already been compelled to cut off the upper parts of my knee-length boots in order to use the fine leather to reinforce my now threadbare breeches at the knees, and thus had managed to retain the lower part of the footwear for the march. After several hours of laboured marching, we arrived at a single-track rail junction, where we were loaded onto a train consisting of a primitive steam engine to which was attached several rail cars. Our journey further to the east began. The train was also occupied by a number of poorly dressed civilians, men and women of various ages. As the train began to move toward the east, an approximately 40-year-old man with a mouthful of silver teeth began to berate us strenuously. The curses directed at the silent ranks of prisoners soon turned to gestures and threats that increased in intensity until a sergeant of the guard interrupted and silenced him. Gulag Hotsi At the end of this journey we were brought to a forest clearing, in which stood a number of wooden barracks constructed from rough-hewn logs. As we stood in ranks we were addressed by a young blonde lieutenant and a political officer accompanied by a group of soldiers. The political officer, who was recognisable by his green peaked cap, was always accompanied by a young woman. We were instructed that it would be our duty to construct the prison camp, the most important aspects being the construction of four watchtowers. The towers were supported by four log pillars and were approximately eight metres in height. At the top of each tower was a small platform, roofed with rough board shingles. We then moved barbed wire fencing into place to complete the crude enclosure. Several days following our arrival at this camp, we observed a long train pull to a stop, and approximately 200 German prisoners dismounted. They shuffled mournfully through the gates of the enclosure, in ragged ranks, apathy etched clearly upon their faces. They were older prisoners, soldiers who had gone into captivity in 1944, when the Soviets had captured the island of Aisel, near the Bay of Finland in the Baltic Sea. A few of them had surrendered near the border of East Prussia. As the columns of prisoners approached, I was shocked by the condition of the men, their close-cropped skulls and hollow cheeks. Their lifeless, glassy eyes stared straight ahead from shallow, grey faces. The ranks shuffled toward us, most men wearing the familiar, rough-hewn wooden clogs, their malnourished bodies appearing lost in the remnants of uniforms that were little more than rags. A sauna was soon constructed, considered a necessity for protecting the prisoners from typhus. We remained in constant danger from this disease, carried by lice and spreading through the camp populace. The lice tormented us incessantly, laying clusters of tiny grey eggs in our head and body hair. The forty officers assigned to a separate barracks were compelled to remove all hair from their heads and bodies in an effort to thwart the lice infestation. The sauna was used both as a delousing station and bathing facility, and we were permitted access in shifts approximately every 14 days. Labour parties were organised, and it was planned that the work details for woodcutting in the forest would be led by men from the officers' barracks under the watch of the armed guards. This plan was soon changed when a labour union functionary from Vienna, who wore a red and white striped band on his cap, assembled the enlisted men and gave an inflammatory speech. Together with a self-proclaimed communist from Hamburg, they were tireless in their efforts to unite the enlisted prisoners against the officers. On the anniversary of the Red October Revolution, the 7th of November, 1945, the Soviet NKVD officer explained to us through his translator that the German Wehrmacht had ceased to exist. He further explained that hereafter there would be no officers among us, and that in the future we were to repay through our labour the war damage inflicted upon Russia by the fascists. In coordination with this declaration, we were required to remove all officers' insignia from our uniforms, including shoulderboards and collar tabs. Any medals and badges were to be confiscated, 
an order having been given to collect and turn into the authorities any devices that were intended to glorify fascism. This order was hardly necessary, as all medals and badges had long since been stripped from the prisoners by the Soviet soldiers in their endless pursuit of souvenirs or items of trade. With this final order to remove insignia of rank, it was clear to us that we had been stripped of any rights and were at the total mercy of our captors. Any reference to rights of prisoners through the Hague Convention was useless. Along with the old prisoners were Christian Burkhard from Wernersberg, Emil Glatz from Ebhausen, and others from the area of my hometown. One Sunday morning I attempted to organise a small choral group with these men. This displeased the Antifa group in the camp, who considered this effort a threat to their authority, and I was thus denounced as an escape risk. During the subsequent search of my belongings, the Russians found a tiny compass needle buried deep within a roll of socks. Theoretically, this needle could have been mounted on a small splinter of wood to indicate magnetic north for an escape attempt through the swamps, and as punishment for this infraction, I was to be placed in solitary confinement for an indefinite period of time. A passageway through the officers' barracks was divided by walls to form a space approximately two metres by two metres in size. The entrance to this cell was secured by a wide door nailed together from heavy planks, which could be barred from the outside by an iron rod. When the rod was slid into the secure position, the door could not be opened from the interior of the cell. Once a day I was led from the cell to be given a slice of damp bread and a cup of thin cabbage soup. The temperature was dropping rapidly with the coming of winter, and the cell remained cold throughout the days and nights despite the presence of a large iron stove that was missing a door. This oven had probably been used to heat the barracks before the construction of the isolation cell, however we were not permitted to use it for warmth. During one of my short respites from the cell, Christian Burkhard met me near the latrine and slipped me several splinters of firewood, along with a tiny amount of tinder material, a flint and a rough piece of steel, with which I could light a small fire. I stuck the material into an inner pocket of my breeches, unnoticed by the escorting guard, who did not discern anything out of the ordinary, as I had already been deprived of my belt and was required to hold up my pants by the waist. Thus I was provided the opportunity to light a small fire in the doorless oven. After several minutes of rest in luxurious warmth, I fell asleep on the floor next to the stove. A short time later I awakened, choking on smoke that filled the cell and gasping for oxygen. A small piece of burning wood had fallen from the stove and ignited the floor of the cell, and I was now in danger of asphyxiation. Luckily, a large number of prisoners who had been stricken with diarrhoea were forming a steady stream of traffic to and from the latrines. I rolled over to the door of the cell, and through the crack between the door and the floor, I deeply inhaled fresh air. Then I began to yell, Fire! I was soon pulled unconscious from the smoke-filled cell with singed clothes and minor burns, and the fire was extinguished with snow water. When I awoke at midday, I was surprised to find myself on my old bunk in the barracks, the building empty, as the occupants had been mustered out on a labour party. One of the guards, whom we called One Eye due to his cross-eyed appearance, soon led me at bayonet point from the camp to the commandant's office. In the dim room I was greeted ominously by two men of the Antifa group, a German-Polish prisoner who served as translator and the German and Russian camp medical officers. The latter was a Jewish doctor from Leningrad. Also present was the political officer and his ever-present female attendant. The hearing was presided over by the commandant, and it was explained to me that I faced the serious charges of arson, sabotage and attempted destruction of Soviet property, and that I could expect severe punishment for these grave offences. My referral to the Hague Convention and the relevant conditions for the handling of prisoners of war with international rights gave me the opportunity to explain further to the commander what had occurred. I told him that sleep deprivation, combined with solitary confinement in freezing weather, without heat or warm clothing, could only be considered inhumane treatment. Therefore, I had taken the liberty of lighting a fire to prevent freezing to death. I spoke of the lack of nourishment that had been experienced by the prisoners, and in closing, I remarked that if my death had already been determined, then as a military officer I should be afforded a bullet.
With this remark, a great uproar ensued among those present. At length, the translator relayed to me that the commandant had proclaimed that no more German officers will die in Russian camps. I was immediately escorted under guard to the camp kitchen, where I was provided a double ration of soup and bread. The work details were dispatched into the snow-covered forests, where trees were felled by hand. All the labour in the forests was conducted without the benefit of machinery. The trees were cut with axes and cross-cut saws. The trunks were then split with mauls and wedges. The sparse rations could not provide enough nourishment for our bodies to enable us to conduct such strenuous labour, and we soon experienced the first deaths. The ground at the perimeter of the camp was frozen to the consistency of concrete, and it was necessary to drag the corpses to the softer soil of the swamps for burial. Here we would scrape away the covering of snow and lay the dead to rest. During these burial details I sought out patches of wild cranberries under the ice, which provided a needed, albeit sparse, source of vitamins. Among the dead was Sorotti. This was not his family name. However, he was from a well-known Hanseatic business family and had managed the Sorotti chocolate factory in North Germany. His bunk was located directly beneath me in the barracks, and one morning I awoke to find him lying with his head cocked to one side, a small rivulet of dried blood on his chin. We dragged him to the swamp for burial along with several others who had died during the night. The ranks of the dead continued to climb, among them the teacher Hermann from Onstmettingen, the young Drescher from Endringen, and others. During the winter of 1945, 1,946 one of every three prisoners from our camp made the final journey to the makeshift cemetery. On one warm spring day, Hauptmann Hermstrova, Oberleutnant Heck and Oberleutnant Schreiber, along with two others, attempted to escape despite their weakened condition. We had previously discussed the possibility of slipping through the deep ruts created by the supply truck, which led under the gate directly before the eyes of the guards. This small group had slipped under the gate and broken into a supply hut to obtain additional rations for the escape before stealing soundlessly into the forest. The ground was still covered with snow, and their attempt was clearly an act born of desperation. All of us were fully aware that under the current conditions we would soon die of exhaustion, disease or malnutrition in the desolate camp. Three days later, Heck and Schreiber returned. They were paraded before the mustered ranks of prisoners, badly beaten and covered with blood. Their threadbare uniforms hung from their emaciated bodies in tatters. This is what happens to those who attempt an escape, we were told. Hauptmann Hermstruwe had suffered a severe skull fracture from the beating and died a few days later. Oberleutnant Heck was eventually released from the gulags many years later, and I met him during the 1960 after he had become Dr. Walter Heck, harbour commander in Kale on the Rhine. One of the reasons for the high rate of death in our camp was the total lack of bread for a period of approximately six weeks. This occurred during the middle of the bitter winter, when the need for nourishment was most critical to our bodies in the freezing temperatures. It was rumoured that the baking facility, located several kilometres distance, was not functioning. As a result, we were provided a small amount of bread meal mixed in warm water, which created a thin, milky soup almost devoid of nourishment. It was also said that we were made to suffer as punishment for the deprivations experienced by the population of Leningrad, where thousands of civilians had starved during the siege. During one of the last days of March 1st, 946, a grey, weary column made its way painfully to a railhead, as we used the last vestiges of strength in our bodies, our skeletal figures shivering as we weakly stood in ranks awaiting the transport. Fully aware that our only hope of escaping death lay with the transfer to a new camp, we prayed that this change would bring us better conditions. At length, we climbed into the rail cars for a one-day journey to our new destination. Borovici The large main camp, with approximately 2,000 prisoners, was situated on a hill. It consisted of 20 barracks, which were sunken into the ground. These bunkers were previously used as a work camp and for the storage of potatoes. There were numerous enlisted bunkers, as well as the Spanish barracks, 
which housed Spanish officers from Spain's Volunteer Legion. After spending a period of time in the medical facility, I was assigned to Officers Barracks 2. A commission to determine the health and work capability of the prisoners was established. The prisoners quickly named these inspections meat exhibits. We were required to stand naked before the Russian commission, and during the examination the medical officers would pinch the flesh on our buttocks between their thumb and forefinger to determine weight loss, which would indicate to them our ability to withstand heavy or light labour. Among the categories were Robochi Group 3, Work Group 3, designated only for light labour, and Robochi Group 4 OK, which was designated for those who could perform only the most menial and light tasks. The last group, Distroph, was used to designate prisoners who were completely disabled from dystrophy and were often inflicted with dropsy. When brought before the commission, it was diagnosed that I was suffering from a particular type of dropsy called edema. My luck remained with me at this examination, as our former staff medical officer, Dr. Shilp, was assigned to assist the female Soviet medical doctor. This extraordinary woman did everything possible to improve the lives of the German prisoners, and we nicknamed her Pupchen, Little Doll. Following World War I, she had worked as a paediatrician in Frankfurt, and she spoke fluent German. Through the recommendations of these two physicians, I was assigned to the camp medical clinic, where I was provided a small piece of white bread, the first I had seen subsequent to our surrender. Through the weakening of the digestive system and the months of starvation in the former Hotzi camp, I was suffering from constant diarrhoea. Dr. Shilp provided a treatment in the form of a tea consisting of charcoal mixed with caraway and yarrow or other herbs that were available. After several weeks of this treatment, I had recovered sufficiently to be classified for Rabochi Group 3 and was released from the clinic. I shared my bunk in the officer's barracks with my longtime friend, Dr. Gustel Hickel. We slept on two tiers of wooden planks, upon which we would spread our threadbare winter clothing, which now consisted mostly of quilted Russian field jackets. The quilted clothing served as protection from the cold and was also used as mattresses, and when necessary, we pulled small bits of cotton quilting from the material for tinder to ignite small surreptitious fires. The keeping of fires for heating in the barracks was strictly forbidden, so we slept closely together during the bitter, freezing nights in attempts to keep warm. Also with us was a young lieutenant named Graf von der Schulenberg. This ancient title of Prussian aristocracy was well known to the Soviets, and until the outbreak of the war, his uncle had served as the German ambassador in Moscow. One day, Lieutenant Graf von der Schulenburg was taken under guard from the barracks and led away, never to reappear among us. It was said that he had been taken to Moscow for special treatment. The camp authorities organised labour parties that were parcelled out to various assignments. Prisoners were provided for labour to a factory that produced tiles and concrete piping. Another workplace was a nearby paper mill. During the summer months, many prisoners laboured to cut peat from the nearby marshes. I was assigned to cut peat, and we dug into the marsh with square shovels and stacked the peat into piles for drying. In the peat kolkhoz there were potatoes and turnips from which a thick soup was made. Despite the back-breaking labour, we savoured the rare opportunity to enjoy a healthy portion of soup. Eventually, a large steam-powered peat cutter was engaged to cut furrows in the swampy ground, and the prisoners would then cut and stack layers of brown-black peat for drying and collection. A very unproductive machine dating from Tsarist Russia was also put into use. This machine was powered by steam, the fuel for which was the peat previously won through hours of strenuous labour by the prisoners. In order to gain a pause in the heavy labour, we could occasionally find intact tree branches and stumps buried beneath the peat, pieces of which would be quickly thrown into the works of the machine to jam the mechanism. An hour or so of valuable rest could sometimes be won in this manner, while the tightly wedged obstruction was being cleared. We began to receive an officer's ration of 10 to 15 papyrossi cigarettes and 5 grams of sugar per day. The enlisted prisoners received machorka tobacco. The internal authorities of the camp now consisted of German communists, and the prisoners remained under the watch of these groups of collaborators both inside and outside the camp. During excursions for work details, we were escorted by these privileged individuals, 
who wore a special insignia on their sleeve. We referred to these escorts as convoys. They were immediately identifiable by their better clothing and their healthy, robust appearance, and among other privileges, they were always afforded generous portions of the rations. Unbeknownst to them at the time, their cooperation with the Soviets, in hopes of early release, was to have the opposite effect, as their collaboration was essential to the Soviet authorities for propaganda purposes and for administering the large numbers of prisoners. In some instances, much to their surprise and dismay, they were to be among the last prisoners to be released. The prisoners received their soup in wooden bowls, and the issue of food was strictly administered to ensure that each prisoner received the same portions from the 10-litre buckets. One bucket of soup was made available to each organised group of 10 prisoners. A small scale was used for weighing each slice of dark bread, and the receipt of the end crust was organised into shifts, each man taking his turn to receive the crust. We were aware that the crust contained more calories. Thus, this portion of bread was highly valued. Within the officers' barracks, discipline, administered among ourselves, remained very strict, as we were aware that our self-discipline and cooperation with one another would contribute to our chances of survival. Pomashki Fabrikie, the paper mill. With the onset of winter, our work detail was transferred to a paper mill. The strenuous daily march by foot for several miles to the peat farm was discontinued. We were now afforded transportation to and from the paper mill, and every morning we would climb aboard the battered Ford truck to begin our ten-hour workday. We were now permitted to rest on Sundays, although this pause in our labour at the mill was interrupted by the requirement for a labour party to retrieve logs from the nearby river. I was inevitably assigned to the logging detail. A thin sheet of ice covered the river, broken only in the areas where the heavy timbers, felled far to the north and borne to our location by the current, were lifted from the water for further transportation over land. For this labour we were issued hip-length linen stockings that were not waterproof, and I soon developed a disabling kidney infection from the hours spent in icy water. I was permitted to spend a number of days lying feverishly on my bunk, as the camp medical clinic was filled to overflowing with ill patients. We continued to suffer losses in the camp, however the death rate did not reach the levels of the previous year. One of the prisoners routinely assigned as a gravedigger was always recognisable by his large, imposing moustache and his completely bald head. One day he fell ill and died from intestinal blockage, caused by overeating. Upon investigation, it was discovered that he had broken gold teeth from one of the corpses prior to burial and had traded the gold to the guards or civilians in the area for food. He had proceeded to consume the full amount received for the gold and had quickly developed the fatal, agonising complications. While on the work detail in the paper mill, I developed a close friendship with Hans Holzknecht, a mine worker from Tyrol. Also present was Gustel Hickel. We were assigned to carry clean piles of grey clay on a wooden two-man litter to an elevator. One day I discovered a data plate on the elevator, Voith Heidenheim, 1898. After my eventual return to Germany, I relayed this news to my uncle Breuninger from Heidenheim, who had worked many years for the Voith company. He had served as a chief engineer for this internationally known turbine and propeller manufacturer. During his apprenticeship in Esslingen, he had received the assignment as a young, unpaid volunteer to dismantle the machinery at the paper mill in Kirchheim Tech, which was to be replaced with more modern, efficient equipment. He was then dispatched to Tsarist Russia to install the machinery at the paper mill near Borovici. My uncle had spent several months as a volunteer constructing the very same paper mill, where I, many years later, was compelled to work as a prisoner of war. Weeks and months passed. We received the first mail from our homeland after almost two years of captivity. Our replies to these desperately written letters were the first indication to our families that we had survived the war and were still alive in captivity. Eventually, our comrades from Austria and the prisoners from Alsace were taken from the camp and returned to their homes. International politics adroitly steered from Vienna was having an effect on our captors. It was rumoured that prisoners from Germany were also being released. The rations improved as well, but remained far below the minimum health requirements. <laughs>
In this camp, I also met the last general staff officer from our division, Major Deschamps. From him, I learned of the fate of other members of my unit. At the time of our surrender, during the night of 8 the 9th of May, 1945, Hauptmann von Wächter from our division artillery had succeeded in climbing aboard a Kriegsmarine ferry, which took the passengers to the Swedish coast near Malmo. In June 1, 945, an agreement was reached between the Swedish government and the Soviet Union that these soldiers would be turned over to the Soviet authorities. The Swedish military strongly protested this decision, but remained helpless to prevent the delivery of the interned soldiers. Upon learning that he was to be delivered to the Soviets, von Weichter slit his wrists and was unconscious when discovered. He was taken to a hospital in Malmo, where he recovered, and he was eventually turned over to the Soviet Union. On an early Sunday morning work detail, I came upon a windfall when unloading a lumber cart that had previously been used to deliver poppy plants to a mill to be processed for hog feed. In the corners and in the cracks of the wooden floor, I was able to recover whole hard seeds, which, when chewed to separate the kernel from the chaff, provided badly needed nourishment. We were also able to retrieve small amounts of corn pulp from the paper mill, which was used for the processing of rough paper. Hauptmann Walter Schechtel had served as the communications officer with the Kurland army. One morning, Schechtel, together with the Spanish officers, refused to muster for work in protest over the poor rations. It had also been planned that the enlisted men would participate in this protest. However, they came under immense pressure from the Antifa group and did not do so. An enraged soldier Tesca stormed into the barracks and with levelled submachine gun forced us to muster in ranks outside. Walter Schechteler and two Spanish officers were then removed and taken to solitary confinement. They were sentenced to life imprisonment, usually a term of 25 years for sabotage, and were soon transferred to another camp far to the east in the Kyrgyzian steppe. I managed to speak with him one last moment before his transfer, and he requested that I advise his parents of what had occurred. I later was able to fulfil this promise. Walter's father was general director of the German linoleum factory in Bietigheim, and spent more than two years attempting to learn the whereabouts of his son through a Swedish intermediary. He was eventually able to gain his release by surreptitiously paying large sums of US dollars in bribes to Soviet authorities. Walter and I met once again in the 1950 and celebrated our reunion in the wine country near Fellbach. We learned to expect sudden interrogations that would take place randomly and without warning. The former police officers, members of the police regiment Riga, and the few remaining soldiers from the Waffen-SS were particular targets of the Soviet intelligence system. As a result of the interrogations, many prisoners would disappear from our ranks, transferred to other camps where they would undergo additional penalties. Included in the prisoners singled out were the commanders of regiments, staff officers and generals. These targeted personnel who survived the ordeal in Russia were finally released in 1955 through the untiring efforts of the German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer. My interrogations usually took place in the presence of two Soviet army officers, a woman in uniform of indeterminable rank, and two Antifa members as well as the ever-present interpreter. I was always asked to affirm my fascist officer's rank and where I had served throughout the war. The operational history of the 132D Infantry Division was known to the interrogators. One of the main questions seemed to concentrate on personal behaviour. What did you eat? Conserve, was always my reply. Conserve da Berlin, the commission would ask. Da da Berlin, from the Heeresseugamt, I would respond. The Heeresseugamt was the bureau responsible for providing uniforms for the army. However, this response seemed always to give them a sense of satisfaction, perhaps because they assumed they had received information from me about an official organisation. Despite numerous threats, coercive behaviour and repeated interrogations, I never wavered from this response. The Commission would attempt to draw me into confessing that I had on occasion requisitioned pork, beef or poultry for my use. I steadfastly replied, conserve. Following one of my interrogation sessions, the Commission called for Oberleutnant von Postel, a former tank commander, 
Under duress, he finally admitted that he had once slaughtered a hog, for which he was immediately pronounced guilty of theft of Soviet property, and was sentenced to 25 years hard labour. He was eventually released in 1955 through Adenauer's efforts. The transport. In April 1, 947, cattle cars at the Borovici railhead were prepared by a work detail with bunks and makeshift latrines. A number of prisoners classified as Rabocci Group 3 were mustered together on a warm afternoon and taken to this location for transport. I was among them and our hearts pounded with hope that we were, at long last, about to begin the journey to freedom. As the train began to move, I could discern from the position of the sun that we were travelling south toward Moscow. On the 1st of May, the train screeched to a halt at a switching station near Moscow, and we found ourselves positioned on a multi-level track on the west bank of the Moskva. Peering through the slits in the walls of the cattle cars, we watched with amazement as unfamiliar aircraft crossed the clear blue sky from various directions, leaving vapour trails in the form of Soviet stars behind them. Approximately two kilometres distance, we could discern red flags flying above the walls of the Kremlin as the citizens celebrated May Day. At length, we were permitted to dismount between the tracks. No one thought of escape, and we remained full of hope that our journey would continue toward the west. After we spent a restless night, the train began to move, but to our disappointment we turned south, eventually crossed over the Don bridges, and proceeded into the heart of the Caucasus. It was now rumoured that our destination was a recuperation camp, after which we could expect to be released. Camp Gagri We were greeted by a flat, endless landscape on a warm summer day as we continued rolling south. The string of cattle cars was now towed by a massive red-painted diesel locomotive of American manufacture. On arriving at the Sochi station, we were ordered to detrain, and before us was an expanse of white buildings nestled among cypress trees, stretching to the grey-green Black Sea on the horizon. After several hours of marching on foot, we arrived at a camp with large clay-walled barracks. Our new quarters were immediately recognisable, surrounded by a perimeter of barbed wire and the familiar tall watchtowers rising at each corner. There were already a number of prisoners in the camp. These unfortunates had recently been transported from prisoner of war camps in the United States to their hometowns in the Russian-occupied zone of Germany, where, upon release, they were immediately taken into custody by the Soviets. In the United States, these prisoners had experienced a confinement vastly different from our ordeal in the gulags. They were well fed and in the best of health, and the former members of tank crews were still recognisable by their distinctive black panzer uniforms, albeit without insignia. I rested against the wall of the barracks and gazed toward the west, where the fiery ball of the sunset sank on the horizon. The camp had remained vacant for an extended period of time prior to our arrival, and soon we began to feel the stinging of numerous bites from fleas as the vermin sought newly arrived victims. We discovered that our new dwelling was thoroughly infested with fleas, and as I attempted to sleep, I was soon attacked by swarms of the parasites. The first night I slept outside under the open sky instead of lying on the rough planks that formed the wooden bunk. The following morning, Rolf Kynes, a fireman from Esslingen, and I managed to obtain a small amount of kerosene from the Russians, which we poured into the cracks of the clay walls and ignited. The bodies of the fleas, swollen with the blood of the prisoners, popped audibly in the flames as we exterminated them. It was at this camp that I experienced the most bearable period as a prisoner. The climate was mild, and the guards did not choose to exhibit the brutality that we had previously experienced. We were permitted more liberty in our movements than before, and the civilian populace in the area seldom exhibited animosity toward the prisoners. Large vegetable farms nestled below the cliffs were lined with green fig trees and citrus groves. Tobacco farms and cornfields beckoned to us, and we were able to slip from the confines of the camp secretly to gather small amounts of the crops to augment our diet. Although necessary to stave off the onset of starvation, these activities were undertaken at great risk, as theft of Soviet property held serious consequences. The death zone between the double row of barbed wire marking the perimeter of our camp 
was approximately five meters wide. The prisoners designated for light labor worked in shifts to keep the sand in this zone raked smooth for the purpose of revealing any footprints that would indicate whether prisoners had attempted to slip through the area during the night. We found such action to be hardly necessary, as it was not difficult to be assigned to an external labour party that was given work outside the confines of the camp. Additionally, a two-metre deep drainage ditch, which remained dry in the heat of the southern sun, led under the barbed wire and was blocked only by a crude barrier of tangled wire. This barrier was easily pushed aside to enable one to slip along the edge of the trench, allowing prisoners to make temporary excursions into the countryside. By this means, we were able to obtain small amounts of fruit and green corn, which we then cooked into a soup in the barracks. A labour crew was assigned to construct a road along the crest of the nearby mountains, and high supporting walls were required to retain the banks of earth as the road was cut through the terrain features. I had reported to the Russians that I was experienced in concrete finishing work, and under the command of a Hungarian cavalry captain I was assigned to this work brigade. One day a Russian guard suddenly decided to prohibit any of the prisoners from leaving the immediate area of the work detail. He strictly demanded that we remain within his sight at all times, thus eliminating any hopes of wandering to a nearby vegetable kolkos. One late afternoon a ground viper appeared from the construction site and slithered rapidly toward the guard post. When the guard saw the snake it was already between him and his rifle, which he had leaned against the roots of a massive mulberry tree a short distance from his location. Hearing the cries of snake, snake, he sprang to his feet and fled in panic. The prisoners quickly killed the poisonous viper with stones, and during the melee, Rolf snatched the rifle and hid it in thick undergrowth some 100 metres distant. Returning from his place of retreat, the guard discovered his rifle was nowhere to be found, and he angrily demanded the return of the weapon. The demands, which were met with indifference from us, quickly softened, and he was soon pleading with tears in his eyes for the return of his weapon. It was apparent that he could expect a severe punishment and would probably be subjected to confinement if the incident were to be discovered by the authorities. Despite his pleas, we continued working without acknowledging his predicament, until at length Rolf retrieved the rifle and returned it to him. Thereafter he became very permissive in his treatment, and we were able to slip away from the Labour Party for short periods of time. Using a broken piece of a hacksaw, I carved tiny chess figures from small pieces of cedar. In manufacturing the crude tool, it was necessary to spend countless hours grinding the blade against stones to sharpen a point and a cutting edge from the thin piece of steel. The possession of knives was strictly forbidden, and the tool remained hidden within a hand-sewn inner pocket of my left trouser leg for many months. I was again stricken with acute diarrhoea, and was ordered to report to the clay-walled barracks that served as the camp clinic. Dr. Kohler from Heidelberg, who was later portrayed in the film The Doctor of Stalingrad, prescribed charcoal. Here I also saw for the first time large candy containers that had been provided by the International Carita Charity Organization. These containers held vitamin B tablets marked with English writing. I was also surprised to experience daily inspections in the clinic by a Russian major who was the camp physician. I referred to him as Gospodin Major instead of using the usual term Tovarich, comrade. The title Gospodin was a term taken from Old Russian for Lord or Master, and the use of this term, together with a small gift of carved figures, pleased him immensely. I also presented him with a charcoal landscape sketch that delighted him. While being treated for the diarrhoea that seemed to plague me continually, I was again placed into work group three. In the pre-dawn hours, the labour parties would depart on the assignments, and I was permitted to leave the camp unescorted to walk the short distance to the Russian barracks where the major's room was located. In his simple room, I was allowed to copy illustrated instructions from a medical book that had been printed in Vienna in 19 o'clock. I made brushes and pens from cattle hair obtained from nearby farms. The major provided India ink in tiny dried cubes that had to be mixed prior to use, and small pieces of condensed colours were obtained from the paper mill, which enabled me to colour the drawings. The Gospodin major then distributed these drawings to medical doctors located in the neighbouring political clinics, 
which had been established as rest and recreation areas for the Soviet working classes. On New Year's Day 1948, a currency reform was set into motion by the Soviet government. The mine workers from the Caucasus regions flocked to the exchange markets on small horses and donkeys to exchange large wads of paper currency where they had previously traded tobacco leaves and merchandise. Many of them found themselves arrested and taken into custody for illegal trading in currency, despite their ignorance of having committed any crime. The workers, having unknowingly committed a serious offence, were often sentenced to hard labour and dispatched to Siberian camps. These measures, undertaken by a government far away in Moscow, served to further alienate the population, who valued their independence from central authority. Among the patients in the camp clinic was Zepp Katzer, a former paymaster from Augsburg. He eventually died from malnutrition. However, before he died, an order had been received from Moscow requiring that all future deaths of prisoners of war be thoroughly investigated for cause. This measure was most certainly taken because of pressure from the International Red Cross. On the morning of Katzer's death, I and several other prisoners were ordered to place his body in the back of a Studebaker truck. The German camp physician and Gospodin Major took their places in the cab of the vehicle, and we were ordered to ride in the back with the corpse. The driver then sped over rough paved roads in the direction of Sochi, and it was necessary to hold tight to Katzer to keep his body from sliding from the open bed of the truck. Our destination was a horseshoe-shaped clinic situated in a grassy area. The building had three levels of large wooden verandas and white-clothed medical personnel were seen gathering to peer from the upper floors as we unloaded Katz's body from the truck. We carried his body into the building and laid him on a table, where we were immediately surrounded by doctors and nurses who gathered to witness the event as Dr. Kohler began to open the body for autopsy. During the process, the doctor made statements about the findings, which were noted by one of the attendants. During this examination, I slipped out the door and explored the clinic grounds, where I soon discovered the kitchen. I was able to obtain a ration of kasha, which I ladled into my ever-present mess tin. A large well was located near the door of the kitchen, and in the nearby garden I found garlic and red peppers. I was stuffing handfuls of these delicacies into my bread bag next to my mess tin when I heard the call, Vidaman, Suda, Vodanada. In response to their request, I grabbed a pail of water that was located just inside the kitchen door. Gospodin Major and Dr. Kohler proceeded to wash their hands in the pail following the operation, and Dr. Kohler then handed the pail to a medical assistant who was waiting nearby. The assistant walked to the kitchen door, tossed the water into the garden, refilled the pail from the well without rinsing it, and returned it, filled with water, to the kitchen without further cleansing. We soon departed with Katzer in our custody. A large pink stain appeared on the middle of the white sheet that covered his body during our journey back to the camp. After we arrived, he was carried to a small hill where the camp cemetery was located and laid to rest among our other comrades who had perished as prisoners. Local inhabitants had told us that in 1,917 prisoners of war had been incarcerated in the camp while building roads through the mountains and that their graves were also located in this cemetery. With the changes in politics, it was ordered from Moscow that the graves of prisoners would be identified with their names. From Gospod in Major, I received a list of names of prisoners who had recently died, and we nailed together rough crosses, upon which I painted the names from the list, using paint mixed from chalk and kerosene. I was later able to smuggle the list of approximately 15 names, hidden in the sole of my wooden shoe, back to Germany, and the names were given to the Red Cross. Thus, a final explanation was provided for the fate of a tiny number of those listed as missing in the East. Gagrilovo. At length, Gospodin Major ensured that I was assigned to a small special camp near Gagrilovo. This camp, also under his responsibility, contained about 50 sick prisoners. An enormous work camp had been located in the shadows of the Caucasus nearby, and it had only recently been disestablished. It had been planned that prisoners would be concentrated at this location as labour for the construction of a massive hydroelectric dam. These plans had only recently been abandoned after consulting a team of German prisoners 
consisting of engineers and related technicians, including the geologist Volrat from my hometown. After inspecting the site, they advised the Russians that the flow of water available, combined with the rate of evaporation in the warm climate, would never produce enough energy to power the turbines. A high commission from Moscow was dispatched to the scene, and the Russians then determined that an error in plans had been made. Thus, the power plant was to be constructed at another location. In the nearby mountains were large stores of equipment that were to have been used in the construction of the dam. One afternoon, I was sitting in front of the barracks filing a piece of aluminum into a comb as I had begun to regrow my hair, which the Soviets had once required to be close-shaven. Gospodin Major passed by and, as usual, asked me how I was doing. Nichevo, plocho, I responded. Why are you doing bad? He retorted. You're very sick. You go home soon. And so it happened. In summer 1948, I was permitted to board a boxcar that was filled with approximately 40 prisoners for what was rumoured to be our final trip to freedom. The journey was said to have taken about one week. However, I was again stricken with severe diarrhoea and raging fever. Lying weakly within the dark car, my condition seemed to worsen with each passing hour, and I was soon too weak to stand for more than a few minutes' duration. Through a feverish veil, I remained barely able to discern between daylight and dark, and was hardly able to comprehend the events taking place around me. At long last, we reached the border. We were herded from the rail car onto the parade ground of a military base on the banks of the Oder near Frankfurt, where we stood in ranks, the chill of an early morning penetrating the ragged bits of various, now obsolete uniforms that hung from our emaciated bodies. Silence hung heavy in the air as we stood motionless, painfully aware that freedom lay only hours, perhaps minutes, away. Through burning eyes I watched a Soviet officer, flanked by a guard with an ever-present submachine gun, pace slowly along the ranks of prisoners. We had been ordered to lay all possessions at our feet. The officer carefully examined each prisoner, then shifted his gaze to the meagre belongings piled onto threadbare Wehrmacht rucksacks and bread bags as he moved down the line. I shivered uncontrollably from the fever. However, my weakness was momentarily forgotten as his expressionless gaze shifted from my face to my clothing, then concentrated on my sparse belongings piled at his feet. A sense of relief swept over me, and I attempted to still my pounding heart as he then turned and stepped to the next prisoner. Next to me stood Oberleutnant Hans Hert from Reichenbach, a small town near my home in Stuttgart. The Soviet officer inspected Hans carefully, then looked at the belongings piled before him. He turned on his heel as if to move on, but hesitated and then stopped. Bending down, he picked up a small, crudely carved wooden box that Hans had fashioned from pieces of cedar in the camp. Examining the box curiously, he suddenly tossed it to the ground and brought his booted heel upon it, splintering the box and spilling the contents. Hidden within a false bottom was an iron cross that Hans had managed to conceal during more than three years of searches and inspections in captivity. The officer picked up the decoration, raised it slowly, and examined the object before looking at Hans. Fascist! he exclaimed loudly. Two guards with rifles suddenly appeared from the perimeter, the officer snapped commands as he glared at Hans. They took positions on either side and pushed Hans forward, leading him away with shoves and unintelligible shouts. Hans glanced over his shoulder at me, his haggard face white with terror. Tell my parents what happened, he shouted desperately. Oberleutnant Hans Hirth did survive, and was eventually released from captivity many years later. The journey continued. With a high fever I was transported through Saxony, and near Hof and der Saale we departed the Russian zone and crossed into Bavaria, bringing my 1,080 days of Soviet captivity to an end. In an ever-weakening condition and stricken with edema, I remained barely conscious as I lay for several weeks in a former military clinic in Ulm. The central area of this ancient city had been reduced to rubble by the heavy bombing raids, and the crests of ragged walls remained marked with wooden crosses to indicate where civilians lay dead beneath the ruins. Under the care of Red Cross nurses, I slowly regained my health, lying for many hours in the shadows of the clinic. I had returned to a world yet torn asunder, 
and I was determined to leave my past with its many horrors behind me. Despite my efforts, I remained lost in the weeks, months and years of a past that I was resolved to forget. My thoughts wandered to comrades lying in unmarked graves, the enemy dead, and the overwhelming challenge of facing a changed world. It remained impossible to comprehend that the long ordeal was over, and that with so much death and destruction our world had witnessed, I had somehow survived. Contrary to my long-held expectations, there was no outpouring of emotion. I felt no elation with the slow realisation of survival, only overwhelming emptiness when reflecting on the victims lost to the apocalypse. Of the twelve members of Gottlob Biedermann's anti-tank crew, who marched into Russia in June 1st, 941, three survived to return to their homeland. Gun Captain Gefreiter Biedermann, 22 years old. Multiple wounds, seven. Surrendered the 8th of May, 1945. Gunlayer Gefreiter Ola, 21 years old. Lost eye near Gaitolovo, September 1942. Discharged with severe wounds. Gunloader Gefreiter Albert, 21 years old. Multiple wounds killed in action near Dunneberg, 1944. Munition Handler 1. Gefreiter Spindler, 21 years old. Multiple wounds killed in action south of Lake Ladoga. 1,943. Munition Handler 2. Gefreiter Eichler, 21 years old. Twice wounded, killed in action on the North Front. 1,943. Munition Handler 3. Obergefreiter Krenz, 29 years old. Severely wounded, Battle of Smedinia, arm and leg amputated. 1,943. Discharged with severe wounds. Munition Handler 4. Oberschutzer Wacker, 22 years old. Killed in action near Gaitolovo, 1942. Machine gun crew leader, Gefreiter Hafner, 21 years old. Previously wounded, killed in action at the Parpach position, February 1st, 942. Gunner 1, Obergefreiter Brendel, 32 years old. Killed in action south of Lake Ladoga, 1943. Gunner 2, Oberschutzer Einer, 19 years old. Killed in action on the North Front, 1944. Gun mover Obergefreiter Fair, 35 years old. Killed in action near Duneburg, 1944. Munition handler Gefreiter Falteich, 35 years old. Killed in action on the North Front, 1943. We learned to scorn death, but to love life with fervour.